the first ensuring the organization is ready is really, to me, you know, the foundation of it all. It's being thoughtful versus opportunistic, I think, is the way I would describe it. Lots of companies have that go global ambition, but it's the how to do it. Welcome to the Modern Marketing Engine Podcast, hosted by Bernie Borges. This is the podcast for the modern marketer who wants to hear from their peers in the trenches and the occasional analyst or rock star influencer sharing strategies and tactics about what's working in modern marketing. Be sure to listen to the end of each episode for Bernie's summary and takeaways so you can plan your next move in your own modern marketing journey. This episode is brought to you by Conversica, the leader in intelligent virtual assistance for customer engagement. Hey there, welcome to episode 269 of the Modern Marketing Engine podcast. I'm Bernie Borges, CMO of Ingresso, and your host. Hey, thanks for listening. Hey, my guest on this episode is John Pincott. John is the GM of Conversica UK. John, welcome to the Modern Marketing Engine podcast. Hey, Bernie. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. I'm excited about this topic. It's the first time that we're actually covering this topic on podcast. So uh, I want to get into it with you talking about international expansion, specifically in Europe, something that you're very familiar with. But before we do that, John, why don't we give my listener just a brief overview and sort of a refresher for those that maybe have not heard of Conversica before. Tell us a little bit about Conversica and, of course, your role there. Conversica was founded 10 years ago with the single-minded vision to create the largest AI workforce in the world. And I won't go into great detail on that, but everybody can look up exactly what that means. It was the brainchild of Ben Brigham, who saw an opportunity in the automotive industry to begin with and how to help dealers engage more efficiently with their hundreds of buying leads through an automated process. And we've evolved and grown ever since then. We now have over 2,000 what we call intelligent virtual assistants in force, 1,500 customers. We've engaged over 100 million humans through our, our IVAs, 750 million conversations. And most importantly, we've expanded region. So we've expanded into Canada, Latin America, and Europe from our base in the U.S. And of course, it's the last one of those that we're here to talk about today and the one that I'm most excited about, Europe. That's right, Europe. Before we get to that, Typical use cases on the intelligent virtual assistants for my listener who may not be familiar with those use cases. So we really play in two arenas. One is within sales and marketing and engaging prospects. So when you have a high volume or a variable volume of leads coming in, marketing does an exceptionally good job of their demand gen, but looking for more efficient automated means of engaging them. And that is the service that we provide through, as I mentioned, our IVAs. And we also play in the customer success or account management. So we have a customer base and in a similar way, you know, there's bottlenecks or hurdles within the communications touch points and you're looking for an automated process to engage those. Those are two of the high level anyway engage, um, use cases. Okay, terrific. Well, John, you mentioned in your overview that the, the company over the 10 years has been expanding uh, throughout different regions of the world. And of course, you are the GM for Conversica in Europe. And so we're here to talk about how to launch successfully in Europe. It's not your first rodeo. It's something you're very experienced in. And also, as you and I prepared for this recording, very passionate about John. So I'm, I'm excited to share your experience and your passion with my listener. And you've identified five stages to successfully launching in Europe. So let's get into it. You said that the first one is really about making sure that the organization is even ready to expand. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I call those five in this session really is my practical steps to running a successful expansion in Europe. And sometimes there will be a, a do as I say, don't do as I do. So I'll, I'll try to sprinkle in some of my experience and anecdotes of things that have gone well and perhaps some that haven't gone quite as well. So the first ensuring the organization is ready is really, to me, you know, the foundation of it all. It's being thoughtful versus opportunistic, I think, is the way I would describe it. Lots of companies have that go global ambition, but it's the how to do it. So in terms of what I consider to be the four tenets of organizational readiness, 
first of all, that the organization is mature enough to expand. And that maturity can be in the form of the team. It can be in the stage of the business. It could be the readiness of the product. But if you haven't kind of cracked the nut in your domestic market, the thought that you're going to be successful in a more challenging foreign market is very, very slim. So organizational maturity, number one. Number two is that you have the resources in place to actually do this, that you've got the technology, that it's extendable for the market you're going into. You've got the human resource and you've got the virtual resource in place. And number three of the tenants is there's a team commitment across the organization. If this is a siloed exercise, you're throwing out a satellite into Europe or whatever market you're considering really is a recipe for, for, I wouldn't say disaster, but it's not going to work as well. And then the last, and to me, absolutely the most important of, of the four is to adopt a startup mentality in the market you're going into or realize that you're in a startup mentality. So you might be coming from a more mature and advanced organization. You know, could be doing 100 million in the US alone. But when you come over to Europe or any other market, you're in startup mode and you have to think and behave differently. The one that really strikes me the most is the very first one, for it to be thoughtful versus opportunistic. I would imagine that you've seen many organizations, whether you've been a part of them or not, that have been more on the opportunistic side than on the thoughtful side. Is that right? Well, absolutely. I've probably been involved with more that are opportunistic. You have a big customer and you know, you're domestic, and most of my experience has been working with US-based e-commerce and SaaS businesses coming, you know, going globally or going expanding. And you'll have one or two customers go, hey, you know, we love what you do, but we operate in this market. Can you serve us there? And it kind of stems from that. That's what I would call opportunistic. Or you get an inbound that you just can't turn away from because it's just so juicy that you want to go and, hey, we got, we got to work with these guys. And you, know, you develop it. The thoughtful at the other end of the extreme is really sitting down, doing your homework, thinking about where next, how are we going to be successful? And I'm going to go through some of those thoughtful steps in a moment. But I think that in reality, there's a little bit of both that probably start most organizations off. You need a flint to start the fire, which is the opportunistic element, but you need to be thoughtful in your approach. Okay. Boy, you're full of word pictures here. And considering this is audio only, that's terrific. So keep them coming. <laughs> It's a great segue to uh, the second stage or step, which is do your homework. So why don't you elaborate on that? In the do your homework stage, some people might think this is the boring bit. You can do it from your office and wherever it may be at HQ, because a lot of it is desktop research. It's starting with, to me, one of the fundamentals, which is what do we do best? What do we do well? And where do we think it will fit? You know, I always say that, you know, there's probably a lot more talent in the organization or experience in the organization than you realize. And there may be some with experience internationally. And so you can start a straw man of what your premise is of where you think might work. But then you really need to start to define the market opportunity. How big is this? And then from there, you get into total addressable market assessment. That's looking at geographies. It might be verticals. It could be segments. And you really need to kind of understand, you know, we're talking about Europe, you know, looking at the countries in Europe, looking at the various markets that exist here. So those are kind of the starting points of your field research. Define the market, get a read on the TAM, and then go from there. Is there more to it than that in terms of doing your homework? Because I would think that you also want to understand things like culture, across the region, competitive landscape, availability of talent, maybe legal issues. And I have no experience in it, so I'm just totally thinking out loud on that, John. You're spot on. Those are absolutely some of the next steps you go through in that research. It's great to establish what my opportunity is. There's a market and there's real demand, and I have a good feeling that we could do business there, but what's the competitive landscape look like? You know, is it dominated by one or two players? Is it fragmented and as a result has opportunity? Has it been saturated already? You know, in the case of Conversica, as we started to look to Europe, and just to remind you, I was first man on the ground. So this was really practicing what I preach in terms of developing some of these steps and going through it. But we looked at the market and there really wasn't a category for what we do. And there wasn't competition. So you might think, hey, that's a dream. 
But in reality, you know, if a market's not established, you have to recognize that you're going to be doing a little bit of spade work in education. You know, we might come to that in some of the execution discussions. Then some of the other points that you raise, culture, number one, or it's near the top of the list. And it's that old, you know, go global, think local. And there have been so many examples of companies who have got it wrong. And, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, I don't know whether you're, you or your the listeners have seen the HSBC cultural differences, you know, advertising campaign, which really brings this whole concept to life, which is putting two images together and juxtaposing the different meanings behind them. And the one that comes to mind, there's a Persian rug, this is kind of European. It says, you know, one is, is this decor? Is this a souvenir or a place to worship? And recognizing those cultural differences, I have a semi-funny, well, I think it's kind of funny example. In my previous company, and we did distributed order management, and we ran a really successful marketing campaign in the US, which was titled, I Shipped My Pants. And the program was run with a my bunch pants? of pants, P-A-N-T-S, pants. Okay. I, if I say it quickly, you'll get what the innuendo was. So it was, I shipped my pants. It went off a storm in the U.S. People thought it was hilarious. It went viral. We loved it. Said, okay, great. We've got, to, we've got to do this in the U.K. So we ran the campaign in the U.K. And within hours, we were getting complaints that it was vulgar. That mm -hmm. So it was an example of not really appreciating the subtleties of culture. And yeah. U.K. is a great example. You know, everybody else thinks... Hey, we have a common language, you know, whatever that we share, but in reality, there are some very significant differences beyond just our spelling. Yeah, that's a great example. I'm glad you shared that. Uh, it's actually quite amusing, but not surprising, not surprising. I kind of knew where you were going with it, but glad you shared that example. Anything else on do your homework before we segue to the third one? Yep. There are a couple more, you know, and this is really the one that all the marketers are going to want to jump on. And it's really understanding the routes or channels to market, you know, and their relative costs, because that's a really important part of how am I going to go to market and what's it going to take to be successful. And when you get into the next future stages of planning, you know, that's pretty fundamental. So you really need to establish you know, what does the media landscape look like? What are the associated costs, et cetera? And, you know, and that also will help you because part of this process is about narrowing down options. You know, when you start, the world is your oyster and you're then narrowing it into, okay, well, back to that question of where next, you know, where do I have the biggest opportunity? Where am I going to have the easiest route into market? And where is it going to be most cost effective? And you put those together and that really kind of creates your roadmap a little bit and also helps you with your ROI. Once you've narrowed that list down and you have maybe one or two markets, then you do a traditional SWOT. It's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats assessment from that short list, including that doing you know a content audit. I view that as a great, should be a strength of the organization, and we'll come to that in a bit, but it is, you know, kind of using and looking at what you've got domestically and also the resources that you've got in place and the resources that you have access to in those given markets. And you bundle all those together within that research, and you should really end with, if not one, maybe two, this is where we go next. And that's what you put into your business case and your business proposition. Okay. And the resources you're looking at, do they include people or is that a separate exercise? I'd certainly include it at this stage. I mean, it, there's a separate element when you actually start to develop the plan of, okay, how am I going to execute this? But absolutely, you know, doing that, what I call audit, audit of the content that you've got in the business and assets that you've got in the business. And one of those assets, of course, is the human. And I mentioned at the beginning, it's often surprising that you'll discover in your rank, somebody who's actually had some real experience that they could lend to this. And then when we get into execution, back to how do you make it successful and, and my tenet of team commitment and organizational wide commitment is that you want to engage the, we'll call it domestic team in, in the process, not a silo, not a satellite. We'll be back in just a moment with the rest of my conversation with John Pincott. Conversica pioneered the category of intelligent virtual assistants for customer engagement, helping organizations attract, grow, and retain customers. First launched in 2009, Conversica's sales AI assistant has over a decade of expertise helping companies find, 
and secure customers more quickly and efficiently by autonomously contacting, engaging, qualifying, and following up with leads through natural two-way conversations. Learn more at conversica.com. You've, uh, you've talked about ensuring that the organization is ready, and you've talked about the importance of doing your homework. And you said then that the third stage in expansion in Europe is to then set your goals and your budgets. This is you know, one of the things that I'm a great believer in. Get everybody aligned, but also what does success look like? And it can be different for every organization. You know, It might be, hey, we want to build our you know, if you're a SaaS company like we are, you want to build our bookings. That's the only thing that matters. We just want to get sales. You know, others might be, you know, we want to create or establish a template, you know, for success for rollout. So setting the goal and defining what success looks like and ensuring that you get buy off across the organization, certainly from a senior level, is pretty key as a starting point in the goals. The next layer down from that is to then you know, establish a realistic set of expectations and timing. And the old adage, and I think it probably comes from the building trade, you know, everything always takes longer and costs more money than you ever imagined. And I have to say, having done this a number of times, that has been pretty consistent. It always takes a little bit longer and is a little, a little more costly than, than you imagine. So, you know, setting realistic measures of success, you know, is another important part of that goal setting and budgeting process. Have some contingency. You know, you may not use it or some conditionality within it. You know, I'm an advocate of the, you know, the walk before you run. So back on those, you know, those expectations, you know, let's do this in a phased approach. It's almost like a proof of concept. You know, we are putting a stake in the ground and we're going for it. We know the market is there. We've done our research. We are not just putting a toe in the water here. However, we're not going to try and boil the ocean in one go. Let's take it one step at a time. And again, as you, you shared the, the example of shipping your pants, you can't just do a, a copy and paste of what you were doing in the U.S., your headquarters, and, and just say, okay, we'll do the same thing in Europe. Because from that one example alone, you've got to really be localized and uniquely strategized on that local market. Absolutely. I think that setting, you know, back to the goal setting and expectations you know, you can start with your benchmarks, perhaps at the U.S. from the U.S. experience, but in a way, you're testing those. You know, in the absence of a better idea of what a KPI might be, you would, you know, you might set, okay, here's my expectation. I'm going to get the same kind of conversion that I get in the U.S. or my cost of acquisition is going to be the same as in the U.S. And you really are testing that, almost like put your thesis out there and then use the process of that first stage expansion to validate it. Just another thought to to kind of share with the listeners, and that is, you know, have a longer term perspective on this. You know, when I was talking about goal setting, it wasn't just what I'm going to do this phase or this quarter or this year. It's really back when you define this market and, and you are, as I put it, putting the stake in the ground, you know, have a longer term horizon and adopt a bit of a land and expand mindset. You know, we're doing this because success then leads on to the next phase. So it's almost, you know, what does rollout and run then look like? And that also helps you in the short term. It helps you when things might not go exactly as you might have planned, that you still have that lo- you have that big, big picture of a longer term in mind. Makes sense. Okay, so the organization is ready. We've done our homework. We've set our goals and our budget. So, John, is it now ready to... Uh time to go to market? Well, I think you certainly have the foundation stones. You've educated yourself. You've made some decisions. You've got buy-off within the organization. And now the fun bit. To me, it's the fun bit. Now you start to really put that plan in place. You know, and I called it earlier, the thesis. I know that there's a market opportunity here. My thesis is, here's how I'm going to go after it, and here's what I'm going to achieve. And as the leader, as in my case, I kind of get to put my money where my mouth is in some respects, you know, to go for it. So the planning process and the more detailed planning process, which includes plan and execution, it's coming back to some of the research that you did, 
looking at your TAM and saying, okay, well, who's my target audience? You know, what's the value proposition? Some of the fundamentals of marketing, those are different. They might need to be a little bit localized back again from the things that you've learned and some of my examples. But this is the same kind of planning process you would go through domestically. So just as you do, you know, your resource planning, your, you know, the details of the execution plan, the, the reach, the content, the channels to market, all those elements would be part of your expansion or your, you know, your European plan development. And in this process, and I want to come back to it because I cannot emphasize it enough, and that is the importance of firstly leveraging, you know, your domestic, your home market resources. And that is both human and, and other assets you may have in the organization. And I always say when I present this to boards, you know, the whole premise of international or market expansion is that you can leverage a lot of the things you have from your domestic market. I mean, it's it's basic accounting or economics. You know, I, I take something that I've already got and I expand my TAM and I put it out there and I leverage it, I'm going to have a great return on investment and sometimes a higher return on investment that I'll get from any domestic program. But starting point of leveraging, you know, some of those home resources and getting, you know, HQ alignment. And within that, and why it's so important is that you really want to get the teams aligned both functionally, but also to have clear roles and responsibilities defined. I always say, you know, the ultimate recipe for success is to make sure there is accountability for some of the results that you're achieving here in your domestic market. And so that might be in someone's, you know, MBOs, management by objective, it might be within their job remit. It might be within, you know, the measures of their performance and their remuneration. So the more that you can tie people from the domestic market into your expansion, the better. I'm curious, John, do you advocate, as a general rule, do you advocate pulling some talent from headquarters from the U.S. over to Europe to kind of pull some of the company culture over? Or do you just deal with that kind of case by case? So I think it's a bit of case by case. Of course, sitting as I do, by the way, my background is I'm Canadian, but I've lived in the UK for 25 years and I kind of feel I straddle the cultures and I straddle the markets. I've run business in Asia, I've run bits in Latin America, Canada, US and here. And so I kind of understand it. So I always say the most important thing you do is hire the right person to begin with. But of course, I'm biased in that. Aside from that, building out that local expertise is pretty crucial to success in, in the market. In any market, local knowledge is pretty key. Again, I haven't done it myself, but I actually, I know many people who who have gone over there as well as been part of the startup organization. And to that point, the local talent is imperative because they know the market, they know the culture. So it just makes, makes all the sense in the world. All right. We ready to get to the fifth and final one? Sure. And just to say on that last one, that we could do a whole session on, oh, I know. on the go-to-market plan, as you know, and you and I had longer discussions before this session. There's a lot that you can go into, but I'm, I'm going on the basis that we've got a great audience of sophisticated marketers. So if they take my comment earlier about do what you do domestically, use the learnings that you've got, make sure you've got the right resources in place for the market that you're going into, leverage the things you've got at home base, and you're off to a good start. Yep. And then you get into the fun bit, the really fun bit. Planning was fun, but the really fun bit is actually getting into the execution. And this really is, it kind of straddles our last topic, which, you know, as you and I discussed, was what I call assessment. And I mean, it's really based on that concept of test and learn. Everything you're doing back to your thesis and your KPIs is your testing and learning, learning what works and learning what doesn't work and doing more of the former and, and effectively less of the latter. And that starts with another fundamental to me, which is around performance and reporting. Don't try and reinvent it for this market. Use what you've got there, but make sure that it's reported. And without giving too many internal secrets away, and back to my do what I say, don't do what I do, you know, one of the things we learned at Conversica is that while I thought that we were pretty aligned and or we had those KPIs and our ability to measure them, in reality, as we started to get going, we discovered that actually geotagging and our ability to track inbound lead sourcing and really understanding the marketing metrics was a little lacking. So we had to go back to base and get that right, which we did. And, you know, as the old adage goes, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. 
And I guess I would add an element to that, which is it doesn't exist. And from that, of course, you can't learn. And, and, and learning is absolutely crucial when you go into these markets. In terms of assessment, you've got the base, you've got your reporting, you should be looking at this on a pretty regular basis, the same cadence as you do in your, in your domestic, but minimal weekly and sharing that up the line. And back to my comment of making sure that you've got the US or domestic team involved. It's taking a point in time whether that's a quarterly or at the end of a phase or whatever period you choose, but make sure you do a really thorough assessment of what we did, how did it go, and most importantly, answer that question. Did we hit our goals? Did we prove the thesis? And do we have a green light for continuance? And it should boil down to be able to answer that question and not have it ambiguous and not have it filtered across 25 different metrics or KPIs. It should really boil it down to, did we succeed or not in what we set out to do? And then from there, that is what gives you the green light to go forward. Over what period of time do you, do you begin to really answer those questions? Weekly on performance metrics. So on in the field, as you are here, you know you are really trying to be pretty agile in your approach to you know executing programs back on that test and learn approach. You know ultimately it's you know back to base. It's 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 monthly roll ups. But on the did we prove our thesis question? That's a big question, right? I, I think that is so situationally dependent, and as I said. You know, that thesis could be a little bit different for each organization and or the measures of success might be a little bit different. You know, if it was building pipeline and, and getting bookings and that's all that really matters, then, you know, you might measure that over a different period of time, a shorter period of time than you might a broader goal around really understanding what it takes to do business and be successful in this market with the eye to expand from there. So if that's your goal, then that's going to take a little bit longer. You know, what does it take to build out a, a larger team? You know, very uh, other things you might consider to be, you know, measures of success. And, you know, that could take you up to a year. Sure. All right, John. Well, I think for this high-level overview, we've covered the five stages. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to segue to um, the part of the podcast episode where I do kind of a recap of what we discussed. And then after my recap, John, I'm going to ask you to elaborate on anything that you'd like to elaborate on. And then we'll uh, we'll get some digital contact information from you for our listener. We'll bring the episode to a wrap. Great. So we began our conversation with a, a refresher on Conversica for perhaps my listener who hasn't heard of the company before from previous episodes with other executives that I've had the privilege of interviewing on the podcast. 10-year-old company, the building the largest AI workforce in the world. Today, you have over 2,000 intelligent virtual assistants, produce over 750 million conversations. That's pretty impressive. You're international. Of course, that's what we talked about here today. And, and functionally, these AI assistants are really used to deliver a personalized message across the use cases of sales and marketing lead follow-up and also customer success are kind of the two big uh, use cases. Of course, our conversation focused on how to launch successfully in Europe, and you came prepared to share with my listener five stages or steps, if you will, on what it takes. And the first one you said is to ensure that the organization is ready. You said that the organization should be thoughtful about it and not opportunistic and really mature enough to expand into Europe. Things like having the, the team and the product and making sure that you know, you're in the right stage of the business. And that you're already successful in the domestic market before you uh, think about coming over to Europe. So then the second step you said is to do your homework, uh, starting with understanding what you do best, understanding what the total market opportunity is, the TAM, total available market, assess that by factors like geo, vertical segments, et cetera, understand the local culture, the competitive landscape, what your routes to market are, and then do a SWOT assessment so that you really know uh, where you're strong and where you're weak. And the third stage you said is to set goals and budgets. And you said you got to start with defining what's success going to look like and uh, set realistic expectations on achieving success. And uh, that includes things like uh, landing and expanding, 
and really looking at it with a long-term perspective, not a short-term perspective. And then, of course, making sure that you've got buy-in on the organizational goals on the expansion. And the fourth stage is to go to market. The fun part, as you said, and that's really having a, a clear target audience that you chose from the TAM, the total available market. Develop your thesis on what you're looking to prove in terms of what success look like. And then the marketing plan, understand what your resources are, make sure you, you build out the local team, uh, everybody, you're, you're leveraging what's available to you from headquarters, and then really defining what the channels to market are going to be, and then you execute on that. And then when you execute, you know, test and learn, make sure you're measuring um, performance and uh, just keep your eyes on, you know, what you're learning from that. Then the fifth stage you said is to uh, really assess are you hitting your goals? So it's, you actually call it the assessment stage. Uh, did we hit our goals? Did we prove our thesis? Do we have enough to gain approval to continue uh, on this path? And uh, do we need to change? Do we need to pivot? So are we on track? So I'll, I'll leave my summary there, John. Those are the five stages that you identified. Once again, just to recap on the five stages, uh, ensure the organization is ready, do your homework, set goals and budgets, then develop the go-to-market plan, and uh, assess how you're doing. Anything you'd like to add to that summary, John? That was a great summary. Thank you very much. I did want to add something. And that is, in the immortal words of Helmut von Mulk. Do you know what I'm going to say? I do not. Or do you know what he said? No, I do not. Okay. Well, you'll recognize the saying, and that is, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Or in this case, no marketing plan really survives contact with real customers. And kind of what that means is that, you know, with all the best planning in the world, you get out there in the field and you are in the real world and you're with real customers and things are rather different. And, you know, you really need to be taking stock of that. And as, I, as you pointed out in the summary, it's that, you know, kind of be prepared to pivot. Don't be afraid to get things wrong. You know, the other adage, fail fast. If you're going to get it wrong, realize it quickly. Don't burn a lot of money getting it wrong. But be prepared to pivot. And then most importantly, work as a team and pull together. And that's it. Love that. Work as a team and pull together. Those are great words to end on. And John, very inspiring for any listener who's a marketer who's either already in expansion mode in Europe or thinking about it. So, John, before we just bring things to a wrap, uh, where can we send my listener to connect with you online? Find me on LinkedIn. Absolutely the best place for a personal connection. You can see what I've done. If you have any thoughts on it, would welcome it. I think I'm the only John Pincott out there. J-O-H-N-P-I-N-C-O-T-T. That's my LinkedIn profile. You can find it pretty easily. And then, of course, go to conversica.com if you want to learn more about what we do and how we might help your organization and its, its expansion. Fantastic. Well, my listener knows that both of those will be linked up in our show notes page. So, John, on that note, I want to thank you for giving us a crash course on what it takes to expand in Europe. Thank you so much for joining me here today on this episode of the Modern Marketing Engine Podcast. Thanks, Bernie. It was great. Good fun. Hey, before you sign off, learn how Conversica's sales AI assistant is helping companies find and secure customers by autonomously contacting, engaging, qualifying, and following up with leads through natural two-way conversations. Learn more at Conversica.com. Hey, that's a wrap for this episode of the Modern Marketing Engine Podcast. If you're not subscribed yet, I invite you to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast player. You know, we're available on all the popular podcast listening channels. And hey, I'd love it if you would give the Modern Marketing Engine Podcast a rating or review in Apple Podcasts. That really helps others to discover it. You know, we publish a show notes page for every episode with links to the resources that were mentioned during the interview. Just visit our podcast page at vengresso.com, and that's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. And remember, just one S in Vengresso. Hey, while you're there, sign up to get the podcast delivered to your inbox each week. And be sure to check out the Modern Selling Podcast, hosted by our CEO, Mario Martinez Jr. Hey, I hope that you'll tune in again next week for another inspiring interview to help you thrive on your modern marketing journey.